Not all heroes wear capes, and in today's video I'm talking to someone who I regard as a hero for science. Her name is Elizabeth Bick, and she is best known for finding evidence of image fraud in academic papers. She was the one who found evidence of image fraud in Mark Tessier Levine's papers, he was the president of Stanford University, and off the back of these allegations actually ended up stepping down from his position as president. Not only that, but Elizabeth Bick is also the one who found evidence of image manipulation in Nobel Prize winner Greg Semenza's work, and just recently, as I reported in my last video, he's also the one who caught out Khaled Shah, a very senior cancer researcher at Harvard University. So let's meet the hero of the hour, Elizabeth Bick. We'll talk here today about a lot of things that could lead me into trouble. Elizabeth Bick, I'm uh, born and raised, and I did my PhD in the Netherlands uh, in microbiology. So that's my background. Uh, I've worked 15 years at Stanford. And since 2019, I'm a full time science data image detective. So my first question to Elizabeth was. How does she find this evidence? Because to me, I find it so remarkable that somebody can simply look at a paper and notice when things look off. It's really not that easy. So I asked her how she does it, and this is what she told me. So I still use mostly my eyes. And, and um, in uh, 2015, around that time, I did a big survey of scientific papers, just knowing how many of those would, if you would screen them, how many of them had problems. And I just use my eyes. So I'm looking for duplications in papers. And in, in images specifically, so that might be, you know, two images that are identical uh, or two panels that overlap or duplications within a panel. So let's say a cell or a blood band has been stamped and duplicated a couple of times. So that's not good. And <laughs> that's usually, uh, you know, not not done by accident. Since uh, about three years, I'm using software and there are several packages on the market. So I'm using uh, two of them, Image Twin and Proofic, to, to help me find these duplications. And Image Twin has a database of images. So you can sometimes find duplications of an image within one paper with another paper. And this is what happened to Khalid Shah. Through the use of software, in this case Image Twin, Elizabeth Bick was able to find many instances of duplicated images that were taken from completely different papers, from different research teams that didn't involve the original authors of this paper. And she even found evidence of the authors taking images from websites that sell scientific equipment and materials being used as evidence in the actual paper itself. Now, Elizabeth has caught a lot of people just using her eyes, but in this instance, if she was just using her eyes, then she never would have caught these researchers out. And of course, if Elizabeth Bick, who is actively looking for these things, wouldn't be able to find them, then there's no way that a typical peer reviewer who's not even looking for these things in the first place would ever spot this kind of data manipulation. So software these days makes catching academic bad actors a lot easier and a lot more reliable. And in my opinion, it should just be built in as a standard part of the peer review process. That whenever you submit a paper that contains images to a journal, it should just be put through Image Twin because then Image Twin's library will grow even larger and of course it'll catch anyone out who is trying to, you know, submit something a bit dodgy. But even without software, Elizabeth just always had a talent for spotting patterns in things. I guess I have some talent for spotting patterns and, and I've always had that. I've always looked at bathroom tiles or, or floor planks yeah. Uh, and if it's a laminate floor, the planks are repetitive, right? The patterns repeat. Right. If it's a natural wood floor, the patterns are unique. So everything in nature, more or less, uh, you know, making a generalization here, mm. is unique. Uh, two leaves uh, are never identical. Two rocks are always slightly different. And so if you think about uh, cells or tissues or or Western blots, the the patterns that you see there might be similar but they're not supposed to be identical so if you see identity then that is usually not good so this point that elizabeth makes about nature i think is why we find her particular brand of academic investigation so fascinating because unlike in my field of behavioral science where typically data fraud happens in a spreadsheet and in a spreadsheet it's very hard to tell whether the numbers that you're looking at are the original true numbers or not when it comes to image manipulation the evidence is right there you can just see it you can see that the two images are exactly the same and like elizabeth said Two things being exactly the same, that almost never happens in nature. But why do scientists do it? Are these people just like inherently evil people? Or is there something else going on? Well, in my experience as someone who's been reporting on these things and who has a lot of conversations and regularly talks to people with PhDs and so on, 
it seems to be more an issue of culture. While it's not true of every single research lab, there do seem to be a worryingly large number of labs out there that have a very broken culture. A culture that promotes quantity over quality, that promotes sensationalism over truth. Because after all, those are the things that are rewarded by the current academic system. And when I asked Elizabeth Bick about why she decided to look into the papers by Khaled Shah, she said it was because she received a tip off about the culture at Khaled Shah's lab, as opposed to any specific paper that that person was worried about. So I, I received a tip um, and this was not a tip as in, can you look at this particular paper? I think there's a problem. It was more, there are problems in this lab. There are corners being cut. There is bullying. There is, you know, lack of proper storage of things. There's infection of cell lines. There's just a bunch of, of problems in this lab. And I, uh, that this person contacted me and, and said, can you look into this, that? And, and I'm like, well, you know, I'll, I'll look into their papers, but not expecting to really find something because, you know, there can be many problems in a paper, but they're not always visible from just looking at a paper itself. And you heard Elizabeth mention bullying there. And bullying in academia, unfortunately, seems to be a lot more common than people like to talk about. Part of that bullying culture comes out of the very harsh incentive system that I talked about earlier, but also it comes out of the huge disparities in power between the principal investigator or the lead author on a paper and the young researchers who are doing the groundwork. Uh, you know, I've heard from other people as well that they've been in labs where the culture has been very much on getting results and trying to make them significant, like no matter what, and um, and having very high output of papers. Um, so do you, do you think these cases of image manipulation or data fraud, are they just a symptom of a bad culture, typically? Typically, yes. I mean, I've heard that, that story all too often where people come to me and say, this is the culture in the lab, it's just bullying. Uh, perhaps there's a lot of people on, on visa, so people who are working in the US or in another country with a temporary work permit. And, and I think if you're in that situation, which I've been in myself, then the your boss, your PI has a lot of power over you. And so there's all these labs that have this culture of fear and bullying. And, and yes, that is where people starting to cheat. And I think this is a, a story I've heard too many times. So I think it's pretty rampant. Um, of course, there's many labs where that's not the case. I've been very lucky to have uh, good, rigorous, slow working and focusing on integrity and focusing on on uh, being very precise. Uh, those were the types of supervisors I've had throughout my career, but I think a lot of people are in, in different situations, unfortunately. Now, Elizabeth Bick posts a lot on her Twitter and on her blog, but she's expressed some frustration online in the past when she reports on these cases and yet nothing seems to happen. Uh, sometimes you, you, you discover something that's wrong with people's papers and then nothing seems to happen off the back of it. Um, can you talk about not, some of those? Not sometimes, <laughs> very often, unfortunately. Very often. <laughs> And one thing that really hit home for me about this conversation was when she made a comparison between buying a car and buying scientific literature. In general, the lack of response seemed to indicate to me that a lot of publishers or editors just did were not willing to to act on these things. And and it's like you know having a problem with your new car, complaining about it with uh, the dealer, and then being told like, yeah, just learn to live with it. We sold you your car two weeks ago. So now we're not going to take any responsibility. And as a cu customer of a, you know, buying a car, we wouldn't accept that. Uh, but apparently in scientific literature, the editor's like, you know, we published the paper, it's peer reviewed. We, you know, we're, we're not going to take any action. And, and I think that is incredibly frustrating and incredibly bad for science. So that was my talk with Elizabeth Bick. I hope you guys enjoyed this interview. If you did, be sure to give me a thumbs up down below because it really helps me out and subscribe if you haven't already. Thank you so much for watching. Show Elizabeth Bick some love in the comments and I'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye.